Welcome to Licking Non-Vanilla, a sex-positive hour of talk about kink, sexual mores, and writing dirty words. So grab a cup of cocoa, your favorite easy chair, and the lube as we go sailing into the dark, sweet waters of all things naughty. On Licking Non-Vanilla with your hosts, Ralph Greco Jr. and M. Christian. Welcome to Licking Non-Vanilla. Uh, another, another pass at this incredible uh, webcast. Web, well, not even a webcast, it's a podcast, I guess. I wish it was a webcast because you see how beautiful Chris is. Um, oh. But... but we get another shot at this, as we always do, and uh, we try to try to go far and wide. And across the aisle from me, my name is Ralph Greco Jr. I think across the aisle from me is uh, M. Christian. Uh, you can call me Chris uh, from the wilds of Eugene, Oregon. But don't call me for dinner. <laughs> and today, Chris, we have a special guest. Do, do we not? We have a wonderful, and I just I'm kind of awestruck guest. Um, we have Marilyn J. Lewis with us today, who is remarkable in all kinds of things. And I think I'm probably making her blush right now. Yes. Um, but, you know, just like, I mean, Marilyn is just like, you know, I, you know, Ralph, will do a write up of, of, you know, your bio and such. But I'm just always impressed. You know, you're a writer, you're a, a screenwriter, you're a performer. You, I mean, just what haven't you done? I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know if I should say that. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And we've known each other for a while, but you know, you're, it's one of those relationships I can't even begin to remember where we first met. I think it was probably some writing project or something. We did actually meet face to face in New York City. I remember that you and I went to um, a diner not far from where I lived when I was on the Upper West Side with Wayne. Um, but I don't remember um, why you were in the city. And at that point, I had already been working with you for a long time. So it goes way back. And I mean, I go pretty far back with Ralph, too, even though um I don't. I don't know if Ralph and I have even ever really met face to face, but no, I, no. I know I was doing otherrooms.com when I first uh, uh, heard from Ralph and started uh, corresponding with Ralph. Um, so that's uh, other rooms was 1997 to 1998. So that's going pretty far back. Pretty far yeah. back. Yeah. yeah. I didn't think. I didn't think any of us were that old. Yeah, I know. I don't feel that old. I, I guarantee. You. I don't. I feel like a kid. And I feel like every day I get more and more um, like a kid. So that's disturbing me a little bit, but <laughs> I'll deal with it. Um, you know, one thing I think is really interesting is you guys have quite a bit in common as well, because you're both uh, playwrights and screenwriters. Um, Cause I know that Marilyn's done quite a number, including a couple of uh, musical ones that are currently on hold because of the pandemic. And yeah. you've done a whole bunch of one person plays or not one person. You know what I mean? Um, one act. One act. One. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought you were going to say we have a lot in common because we're talented and gorgeous. Well, that's <laughs> there's that too. <laughs> oh, of course, of course. Oh, let's, let's, come on. Um, obvi, as the kids say. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, Chris, I think you know you you tend to sell yourself short sometimes, though, because I think I think you have a lot your hand in a lot of pies as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. Just just a wide variety of stuff you write. Mm -hmm. um, so oh. although with, you know you may maybe you're not you're not poking yourself into you know writing writing one act plays, but you certainly write a wide variety of stuff. So I think we're all probably in the you know varied interest and in varied production uh, oh. mode. You know. Well, you're very sweet. Thank you for that. But just that I'm really kind of fascinated by the whole screenwriting and stage, you know, writing thing. I've never done it, so I'm just I find it really kind of fascinating. Um, I know you had a bunch, Ralph, and I know Marilyn has has a couple as well. Well, well Marilyn, I, you know, yeah. I, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I, I the first thing that comes to mind. I think you would agree is that in that kind of writing, especially with the playwriting, it's a it's a collection more than anything else I do. Would you find the same thing is true? 
Yeah, yeah, I do. And I also like for me, um, if you know, if we can sort of like backtrack for like 10 years, you know, um, when the um, national publishing erotica market just really exploded and just disappeared, basically, and yeah. um, it's shifted so dramatically. For me, it was um, making the move into screenwriting and TV, um, developing TV pilots and, and plays was because I needed um, another way to sell my writing because the erotic writing is still my first love. That's what I love to do the most. And um, then all of a sudden, like, it's not like it completely disappeared, but the the money disappeared. That's for sure. I couldn't make a living at it anymore. And so I had to come up with other ways. And that might be like a really weird um um way to get into <laughs> you know most people would probably go the other way like i couldn't make any money writing for tv so i had to write porn you know <laughs> right, right, <laughs> but right. me it was like oh no nobody will buy my porn i gotta do something you know right. respectable <laughs> right, right. So, so in that vein tell us what you've done in the in the tv and you know movie. Well, I, you know, I have had, um, let me see, two TV pilots in development for, for eternity. And um, I'm not really sure. I, I don't know. You never really know when something's going to turn around. Like w the one that got the most um, uh, traction that still hasn't gone anywhere was um, all uh, African-American cast based in Cleveland in the 1960s dealing with um you know, the uh, racial um, unrest and uh, riots and stuff like that. And um, I grew up in Cleveland, but I, was, I mean, I was like a really little girl in the 1960s, but I remember all that stuff. But anyway, it became sort of an issue because I was white, you know, and um, so it was like, well, you know, you don't want to. Anyway, I'm not going to go there because that's political. But so Are but that's still actually, white. What am I still white? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm still okay. white, and the TV show is still black. So, okay. but oddly enough, the play that I'm um, doing um, that we're doing a staged reading of that I'm super excited about um, that's coming up in November is also an all uh, African American cast, and um, and and the people, um, the actors and producers and stuff that have got on board have been really excited about it. So, um, you know, so I wouldn't just I'm not going to say that the TV pilots never gonna happen um but um it did sort of come to a, a little bit of a screeching halt there which really disappointed me but you know you, you just kind of have to wait and um you just kind of have to wait and see you know yeah, so and then the other one was uh the other pilot it was a a mystery um <clears throat> like sort of like humorous um, mystery with uh, all women of all different uh, race, ethnicities or whatever. And um, the, the producer who was on board with that died. <laughs> so, well, that's a kid. So, <laughs> anyway, that's where that one's going. So how dare, how, how dare he die? You know, what I know, awesome. he died. <laughs> That's a headache often when you're dealing with like, you know, those kind of productions is that there there's so many moving parts and they can come to a screeching halt or take off like a rocket at a moment's notice. It's like, right. you know, I've, right. always kind of, I've always kind of resisted trying to like, you know, do something for like, you know, particularly television because it is such a roller coaster ride. I got enough stress that it is just doing the little freelance works I do. But yeah, it's it's really not for the timid. No, you kind of have to always, always, always be willing to um, um, just change everything. <laughs> you just always have to be willing to change, and yeah. But but erotica, if you had if you had your your druthers, it it would be erotica, and if it would be erotica, and I'm asking, and if it would be erotica, what what part and parcel you know type of erotica would it be if you had your druthers? Well, I'm actually really excited because I signed a multi-year um, contract with uh, Black Lotus Books, which is um, starting up, I think, next month. And all they want is taboo erotica, anything that pushes the boundaries of taboo uh, erotica, which for us, I mean, uh, minus pedophilia, of course, but for people of our age, you know, who were writing erotica back in the 90s and um, on, um, it, these subjects aren't really that taboo. They've become taboo over the, the recent years, you know, yeah. um, and it's harder and harder to, uh, to get them published. Um, 
even as ebooks, you know. And um, so this publishing company wants only taboo erotica. So that's really exciting to me because um, that's what I love. So I've already written a couple things for them and I'm writing a third, a third thing for them right now. And um, so I'm super happy. I'm, I'm super happy about that. You know, I hope that the, the publishing company really, really takes off. So. Well, like it's interesting, you know, like they do change the goalposts to what's, a, what's taboo and what isn't what's niche yeah. and what isn't, you know? Yeah. Yeah, they do. And I mean, it's, I and it's know, frustrating. Yeah. I wouldn't like you said, I wouldn't even know what falls into that category anymore. You'll know when you're trying to get something published and they say, Ooh, whoa, we won't touch that anymore. <laughs> that's, that's, that's when you'll know. <laughs> I, know I know a lot of times it's set actually not by the publisher, but the distribution company like Amazon or something somewhere. That's why, you know, working for like, you know, Renaissance eBooks and such, there's always like the five deadly sins that you can't touch. And it's not necessarily because the publisher won't touch them. It's because like Amazon will, you know, freak out and maybe even block the publisher's account. So it's right. kind of a and sorry kind of thing. Right. And that, you know, and that came up, you know, Amazon wasn't like that in the beginning either. You know, I mean, that kind of stuff because they got attacked by people, you know, to stop doing, you know, to stop publishing certain things. But I don't think this publishing company is relying on Amazon. So because because of that, it is an issue. And it's an issue for me, too. It's like the stuff that I really want to write a whole lot of stuff is going to get flagged by Amazon. So I, I don't even bother, you know, submitting it to them. But, um, yeah, but yeah, it's an issue. The distribution is an issue too. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I don't, I, maybe this is a naive question and she only kind of know how to ask cause I'm kind of stupid, but, um, oh. well, it's okay. I know I am, <laughs> um, I re but I revel in it, Chris. Um, <laughs> what, what, what changes the field then? What makes something taboo one year and then not the next year? I think that what, um, if I can just step right out and say that yeah. it's, it all comes down to money, you know, when they start seeing other people are, are, are making a lot of money off of it, then everybody else wants to get into the field and they, they, they don't get quite so afraid of, of, of people, um, you know, protesting them. I think it's always a money chain. Everything is always a money chain. It's, oh, it's po politics, anything, whatever the religion, yeah. it's always money. Yeah. I, yeah. I was just it's giving, I don't know about you, Chris, but I can't keep up. You know, I just, I, I can't keep up as much as anything of what words I can't say anymore. And, and I, know. <laughs> I just can't keep up and I can't. And as far as what's taboo and was I like you guys, I kind of just try to write from the heart and figure, well, and, and see where it lands, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Absolutely. And that's, that's something that it's like, I think I kind of unconsciously still keep to that five deadly sins of, of um, underage, non-consent, bestiality. Um, I always remember, forget one or two, pee and poo, and I think there's another one in there, um, incest. Um, I just sort of like have got this kind of unconscious pick where I just automatically kind of steer away from them. So if someone said to write taboo fiction, I don't know if I could actually do it. <laughs> well, if, if you're, if I'm using that as the litmus test, and I, and I don't know if, if you'd all agree, but if I, I'm using that as a litmus test because some of those things maybe are taboo um, for sure. Then I, I would only ever, if I ever wrote those things or if I ever would, they're always in the form of fantasy. They're, they're, they're not, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or like, you know, we, we do cross genre with some sort of, you know, creature or whatever. I mean, right. Um, right. I, I don't know. How, what do you think? What's your feeling on that, Mary? You know, I think that certain things uh, I personally don't want to write about because they don't interest me. But um, what I think is uh, really interesting is when you're looking at um, like uh, I like to look at hentai, like 3D hentai uh, porn videos, you know, the animated stuff and the, the things that the animators, they really go into um, what would be considered, like you're saying, like be considered taboo territory, but they're presented as fantasy. And so all of a sudden they're in this other realm. But it really is the taboo realm, yeah. like almost to the nth degree, you know, because they're relying on fantasy. So, um, I, you know, and there's like a huge market of viewership for, for that, for those kind of videos. And I, I think that if those are like younger people, I think, you know, I don't know, you and I are watching them. We're not that young, but, right. um, you know, but I, I just sort of feel that, um, if it interests me and if I'm really like into writing about it, even if it falls into those taboo areas, I'm just go at this point in my life, I'm just, 
uh, I'm just going to go ahead as long as it's not illegal, you know, I'm yeah. just going to go ahead and, and write about it and, and see and see where it falls eventually. Because as we all know, the tastes and the times constantly, they constantly are in flux, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned hentai because it's like, it's particularly one of my favorites as well. And I do like the fact that, you know, you, you, it's pretty much almost all, you know, anything that goes except for like maybe if it's an older one and, you know, the Japanese being, you know, having anti pornography laws, they have to use the old mosaic thing. But right, it's, pure, right. it's pure fantasy because it's like, you know, it's again a cartoon character. Um, so I just think that's really quite fascinating. I, I think so too, because if you take those, like it, it, it's in the old days, uh, well, I guess like from, let's say the eighties on when certain things were not allowed to, allowed to be photographed anymore, like anybody under the age of 17 or whatever, or younger, whatever, couldn't be photographed anymore. And before then they could, um, whenever, when everything started to really radically change, it was like, okay, you couldn't put it in picture form, but you could write about a lot of that stuff. It was still legal to write about it, but you couldn't just, you couldn't photograph it. And now it's like, well, you can make all these um, incredibly great 3D, sometimes incredibly realistic 3D movies about it, but we don't want you to write about it anymore. So it's just odd, you know, it's like, it's all comes down to the, the human mind and um, the conditioning of any particular culture, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Because erotica writing, even way back, you know, like uh, the Olympia Press days and and even before that, but certainly Olympia Press days, um, where if you remember Masquerade reprinted all of those, uh, all of those wonderful writers from that era and um, the kind of things that they were writing about, a, a lot of that stuff is considered taboo now. But that was like what erotica w was back then. And now it's mm -hmm. like, oh, no, now you can't write about that. So to me, that's it's just really frustrating. Before we go any further, guys, let's just give another um, uh, station identification. You are listening to Licking Non Vanilla uh, and the, the podcast with the mostest and the bestest and the dirtiest. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're in the middle of a really interesting conversation, I think, uh, about writing and or reading erotic. Um, and they, they, whoever they are, and I agree, it's the power, it's the, the thing, it's a money thing. Um, it, it comes down to what, what you can, what is out there, what's available. And, but I think, I think when we, I think we'd all agree that pretty much if you're interested in something, you're going to be able to find it. Do we, will we all agree on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I guess is a good thing, right? I mean, uh. I guess it's a good thing. I mean, I guess like to me, like anything that, well, you know, it's, it's a really gray area because certain things are just um, like, if it's involves children, it's going to be really damaging to them and, or right, you know, right. actual slaves, you know, you steal, you know, you kidnap people and, you know, make them slaves, whatever. That's, yeah. that's illegal. That's really bad. But um there's things like in the realm of the human mind, you know, that I just don't see if you why thinking about it has to be illegal, you know, to think about it. And and certainly erotica is fantasy and it's it takes place in the mind. And I understand that there are always going to be sociopaths or psychopaths that take it that step farther. But ever, the rest of us are like penalized because of what other people might uh, actually act out on but I think that it's real I've always sort of felt that if it if it's part of the human mind then you know it's some level it's acceptable as long as it's you know stays in there <laughs> yeah I think I think that if, if you're of a mind to do some damage you'll find I know a lot yeah of things that set you that, in, in down that road yeah, you're going to do it and you're going to find it. Yeah, it, I mean, I agree, but it's not like you don't want to be that person in um, court like back when we had the whole COPA trial things going on with the federal. Um, I, I guess you probably all know we were all involved in that. But, um, you know, you don't want to be the one trying to uh, defend that <laughs> that kind of thing, you know, yeah. um, even though we agree um, that it's going to happen anyway. You don't want to be the one that's in court trying to uh, that that's your defense. <laughs> so yeah. kind of weak yeah. at that point. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, it, it's also interesting, I think, that the same kind of argument is often, you know, pushed against video games. It's like, you know, oh, there, yeah. there's this erroneous connection that video games cause violence. And then they point to like, 
you know, a couple of weird examples. And usually some, I mean, people who really understand the phenomenon, really understand how people process fantasy. It's just like, you know, it's actually the exact opposite that, you know, people who may, you know, like you said, be, you know, challenged ethically and morally and are drawn to them as opposed to the media themselves causing it. So, you know, it'd be kind of a situation where you ban people who just simply enjoy it, but have, will never actually ever think about actually doing it in real life. And it just gets, it's that kind of simplistic kind of like, you know, thinking that I think that drags us backwards. Right, right. And it seems like now I don't want to cross the line into politics. If you have the thought, then you then you're gonna act on it and it's gonna be harmful. The thoughts that are in your head will be harmful to the culture. And that just to me is so scary, you know, that kind of thinking. Yeah, I think and that I guess it's just a, it's just a bunch of it's like you're saying to have the thought and to write the thought is 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 a chasm away from acting on the thought. Because mm-hmm. yeah. I've run into this problem a lot of times because because of the the different stuff I write. Some of the stuff I write is is children's stuff, and you mm-hmm. know, you, God forbid that Twain. You even talk about two of those different types of writing in the, in the same breath, you know? Right. I know. Right. My, my, yeah. my contention always is, you know, most adults, you know, with, with some sort of modicum of intelligence, um, know the difference and know what I'm talking about. and understand that adults have sexual fantasies and, you know, and then also you could, you could certainly talk about uh, nursery rhymes. You, you don't like, there's no, there's no reason for, for one to be, one can't be in the same space as far as in the same conversation from the same author, you know? Right. And, uh, right. but, but there, but there is a fear of that all. The, and I, and rightly so. I mean, you know, children do need to be protected. Nobody would argue that point, but like Chris said, you know, some of this stuff is just, it becomes like an argument that you almost sit back and you're like, well, obviously, but this is not what we're even talking about, you know, mm-hmm. but people get their back up over something and they start spinning in a way where you're like, look, we didn't even go there. Nobody even talked yeah. about that. That was, you know, so so I think it's you know much ado about nothing. But unfortunately, but but again, if there's money to be made being contrary to the opinion, then I guess that's why people are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I completely agree. It's like there's also often kind of the exact opposite. It's like kind of a whole thing is like you know you you've heard we've all heard it before. It's like someone will come out and condemn whatever it is. I mean, it could be everything from 50 shades of gray to a video game. And yeah. instead of, you know, the, the, the contrary reaction is suddenly that becomes tremendously popular. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. So if you just, if you just kind of leave people alone, I think it'll sort of like self contain but it's when people start pointing their, you know, think about the children. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that, it, it's like the strike, it's, it's called the Streisand effect that when you, protest something you actually draw more attention to it and actually you know it's like it just it just makes no sense but again you know we're talking about people who don't really think that all that logically right right well, and, and this is an, these are emotive subjects i can understand people getting their dander up very quickly and getting upset um so a lot of that a lot of that a lot of it is well's intentioned you know mm-hmm. and um and they get they get led astray by their own passion and yeah, that's fine it's just it's just I, I and I'm you, Chris. We've talked about this before on the show many times. I just want a reason conversation. That's mm-hmm. all. You know, a little right. tolerance on the side. Whoever, even if it's a repellent to you, and like a little, and just because I ask you a question or 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 I have a difference of opinion, don't immediately um, dismiss me. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, why Why can't it just be as valid as yours? That's all. Mm-hmm. You know. Right. And at the end of the day, what's wrong with a little spanking? Right. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Donald, Mike, let's just take it easy. Take it down a notch. You know? <laughs> well, so, well, one thing I think is also we've, we've touched on a little bit here is fascinating is how we mentioned before how erotica used to be. I mean, when did it stop? I'm not too sure. I mean, there went through this huge surge, you know, with the advent of ebooks and such. And then it's kind of like, it, I don't know if it's really died off as much as gotten diluted. Um, you know, because there's so many books now and so many, you know, ways of getting out there that, you know, a lot of publishers just simply can't, can't keep up. 
um, or can't get themselves noticed enough. I mean, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who was a publisher the other day, and it's just like they're bemoaning the fact that sales keep flipping. But I, I always remind them that they're still a business, which is a huge accomplishment. But that's why a lot of people are doing the self-publishing route, um, you know, and kind of getting their books out on their own. Well, you know, that's like a real double-edged sword in terms of, uh, in my opinion and in my career, doing the signature series where we started to actually publish ebooks, And that was really in the beginning of that. Um, what I saw, well, that's when I saw that the traditional uh, erotica publishing market was starting to go under. I, I could see that it was starting to happen. And um, so ebooks and self-publishing, I think, is a great um, tool for people to become writers and to um, not have to jump through any hoops or to go through the gatekeepers and all that stuff. And I am, and, and have um, maybe have real self-expression, although I'm seeing that, you know, getting whittled away. Um, but um, so there is like a really great thing to be able. And I, I, we come from the old school where if you turn in something to a publisher, it's a really long time before that book comes out, you know, mm-hmm. back in the old days. Right. So you had to wait a really long time. And so now you didn't, you don't have to um, have that. You can publish yourself later today if you want to, you know. Um, But then the other side of the coin is that um, these were a lot of people who hadn't um, come through the the ranks. So the quality of the eBooks was um, questionable. And when it comes to erotica, we always had that stigma that we weren't, um, the writing wasn't as good as, as the other genres, which I didn't think was true, you know, but um, when the eBooks just kind of flooded the market with um, questionable quality because people didn't know how to edit themselves um, or to even get get an editor and then it brought um the overall um market for erotica whether it was traditional print or ebooks it it brought it down because it put us right back where we started um back in the early 90s or you know around then where erotica had that bad rap of not being very well written you know and um so that to me that was really distressing to see that happen that it just became it went back to what it was like that reputation for not being um respected uh, not a respected genre and all that stuff and um e- even when i after the co trial i i stopped running the eaa and i turned it over to some other people who just ran it into the ground as far as like the quality of what they were doing and uh, all that kind of stuff it really just broke my heart you know and um so i kind of had to walk away from uh erotica like i was doing novels but the short story stuff i i really just had to stop doing because it really just broke my heart what was happening you know I'm it's, talking about like 2010 or so right. around there. Right. Yeah, I would say this about the time I felt Chris the sea change because when you and I first met, um, was when I first hooked up with Renaissance, E Renaissance, and and it, things were going pretty good. Mm-hmm. And and then I would say a couple of years in, we were good, cucking along, and then you know you started to feel a, a bit of a change in mm-hmm. yeah. what what was just what was available. Mm-hmm. And, but, you know, what, what happens is this happened in the music business, too, because digital became, you know, the advent of digital and and anybody could go into their basement and produce something. Right. You have a lot of stuff up there that was, you know, not not quality of musicians that I, I was used to. Um, right. Good or bad. Yep. But but then you had then if for not, if nothing else, you just had a lot of stuff out there. Mm hmm. And you know, rising above the the, um, the the getting any kind of attention or rising above all that was that we were in a position where there's just there's just too much, and then it's really hard to to be seen, yeah. heard, and or rise above that. You know, oh, yeah. or even yeah. or even find out what's out there if you you know that you right. might like. You know, okay. but yeah, again, the other side of that coin is that um, there are some amazing, um, really gifted musicians and songwriters who who in the old days would never have gotten a deal because exactly. they're not commercial and they're wonderful and they can, you know, I mean, I don't know how much money they're able to make it if they're not right. merchandising right. themselves, but, you know, but it's still the, the expression, you know, you can go out there and you can do it and you can um, get some sort of a response. Yeah. I mean, that part's really beautiful, but, but again, the other side of the coin is um, a lot, everything gets out there and you have to wade through it to find what you like. Exactly. Yeah. I think that, that, that puts it very well. And that's kind of echoes the way I always put it. It's like the old days of publishing, 
getting published was the hard part because there was only a certain number of publishers. And right. so, but then after that, you know, you did you still had to do some publicity, but it wasn't a major part of it. Now that's completely flipped over. Anybody can get published, but it's the getting noticed that takes the work. And oh gosh, yeah. Yeah. On the quality because you know, I mean, I blame Amazon because they just sort of said, hey, we can offer the service. And that's also the reason why we could see this backlash, because they said basically these places that hey, send us anything and we'll publish it. Well, then, of course, people turned in the stuff that wasn't appropriate. And then Amazon got caught and then kind of like backpedaled so much that they started this almost kind of, you know, ridiculous level of, you know, requirements. Like you can't have that. You can't have this and so forth. Back when I was working for a publisher. It was like we actually had to go almost overnight and change almost every title in the catalog that used the word slave or kidnapped um, because that was one of the words that would get the book, you know, kind of like blacklisted. Right. And, you know, now, like, really, it's like the problem is you get these people out there who, I mean, not to dismiss their passion or even their ability, but they don't think about how to present or package a book that actually makes it look professional. So right. they end up with like, you know, bad copy editing, they end up with bad covers and, you know, it, I hate to say it, but sometimes the worst thing you can do is make your book look like it's self-published, you know, That's because true. it still has this kind of anathema attached to it. That's true. So what, what, what else do you have going on that what way do you, we know we need to know about? What else well, well, I, as you guys know, uh, I just um, published The Guitar Hero Goes Home, um, yes, which yes. both of you guys reviewed very nicely for me. And so it's not my usual um, erotica, although it has um, a lot of explicit sex in it, but it's um, a whole different kind of um, a book than I've written before. And so that is out now and that is self-published. And actually, I ended up doing that with um, Amazon. Um I did the print edition with Amazon and right now it's only on Kindle, but in December it'll go like worldwide. Um, I'm going to do the ebook with Lulu after um, the Kindle select is um, over, you know, the time limit is over. Uh -huh. um, so that'll, that'll be uh, available. And then um, I have um, the play coming up in November on online. It's just a reading. It's not the actual play, but it's, yeah. um, Broadway actors and uh, off-Broadway actors and producers and stuff. I'm super excited about the level of talent that got on board with that. I'm really excited. And that, um, like, if anybody wants to watch that, um, the premiere, um, there, there'll be a premiere on November 22nd. And then um, if you email me or go to my website or whatever, you can find out about that. And then it'll be um, free to stream for like three days after that. And then it, it becomes password protected because it's equity actors and stuff like that. Yeah, um, but I'm super excited about that. And there is music in that. And, um, uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a play about a, a, a black writer in a uh, painter in Kentucky. And she's a hundred years old now. And she's, um, does what I think are wonderful, wonderful paintings. It's a story about her life. And, um, and then, um, then I have the things with, um, uh, black Lotus books coming up where I have one very long short story that they're going to be selling as an ebook called half moon bride. And that's Futanari porn, you know, hermaphrodite porn. And then, um, then they're going to do a new novella of mine called uh, 1954 powder blue pickup. And that's going to be in, um, print. That's going to be a print book. And I guess also ebook, but that's going to be with black Lotus. Well, that's excellent. I, I and then I'm working on another thing for that. What? I do want to give a big hop, uh, shout out for Guitar Hero Goes Home because that was really a fu fantastic book. I thoroughly enjoyed that. That was Thanks that was so really a fun treat. treat. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Ralph. <laughs> Thank so, you. So, where where can people find you? Uh, my website pretty much links you to everything else that you can um, find uh, about me, and I also um, am involved in a um, film production company and. Um, West Hollywood in LA, um, where, um, me and this other guy, we, uh, write and produce and film, uh, very, very, um, 
high end. What, I'm not sure what you would call it. It's abstract and it's absurd. So they're funny, but they're presented in very um, artistic sort of Bauhaus um, vein, a very short subject film, anywhere between one minute to like 12 minutes long. So um, that is um we're in the we're in the stages of we've been doing that for a couple of years already, but we're but COVID just completely knocked us out of the water. We were supposed to start filming last spring, and so um, but all of that kind of stuff is on my website and um, links to all my books and um, all my projects. Well, and as always, Chris, you know, when, after we, we when, when this episode goes up, um, you know, I'll blog about it and then put put all the appropriate pictures and links, you know. Um, for you, you know, um, you want to send any, um, any nudes by all means do so, um, <laughs> we won't put it up, but it's just for me, Chris and I, um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll pimp everything out as, uh, as we always do, you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Chris, you have, you have, do you have anything else? I just think this is wonderful. It's so great to, and it's so great to reconnect with you, Marilyn. It's just like, it's so fascinating. I'm just like, again, I'm really quite, you know, envious of all the stuff you're doing. I think it's really, really great that you're, you know, staying in there and finding new opportunities and such. So thank you once again. Thank oh, you. gosh. Yeah. You don't have to thank me. That's for sure. Yeah. No, yeah. It's been a great conversation. It's always wonderful to speak to someone in the business and a fellow writer and somebody who's in the trenches and has been for as long as we have. You know, it, it's kind of like a, a shortcut. We could just talk about everything because we've all been there, you know. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Yeah, it goes way back. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Nice to know we're all in our mid-20s, though, so it doesn't go that, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, right? Oh, my God. <laughs> but, you know, that's the way it is. Um, well, we're going to say goodbye to you, but we're not going to say goodbye to each other, Chris and I. But we're going to say okay. goodbye to you. But, well, but thank, thank you, you so much. much for having me. I really enjoyed it. I love talking with you guys. Back at you. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank okay. you so much. All righty. We'll speak to you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. So, Chris, that was the wonderful, the delightful, the delicious Marilyn J. Lewis. She's a great girl, isn't she? Oh, it was fantastic. Absolutely. I mean, I've known her as well. Yeah, like I mentioned in the show, I've, I've known her for a while. I can't remember exactly where, you know, where how she first looked up. It's kind of like you. It's like, you know, it's just like, I, I can't really pin it down, but it's always been wonderful, to, you know, that she does so many cool things and is such an activist. And yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah. She had a lot to say. And, you know, and, and you know, I mean, kind of mirroring, mirroring and echoing our thoughts at all times. We're about exactly. uh, the state of exactly. erotica, whether and state of art in general, you know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's funny what you mentioned that they, you know, she had to branch out because erotica. And it's like we both done the same. I mean, different, and, you know, sometimes similar, and sometimes different directions because you know, the market was never really all that you know, profitable, at least for authors. I mean, you know, you used to get advances for books, but of course that disappeared pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, it's like, you know, I, mean, I only know a few writers who are still writing erotica and able to make a living at it. Oh yeah, very few. And I mean, you know, it's funny too, you say that the other day I went to a, there's a store close to my house and I picked up a bunch of porn magazines. That, so I haven't looked at any of that in a long time, whether it be uh -huh. Hustler or high society and i grabbed a bunch because i figured well let me look at what's happening out there if there's any place for you know porn or erotica writing and i gotta tell you that out of the three or four i picked up maybe one magazine had a story in it mm -hmm. so even those aren't really carrying stories anymore and we, we used to we used to talk about this all the time there was a there was well-known science fiction writers that wrote for these magazines you know to, exactly. to you know and, and i mean it's not not that way anymore and i was surprised that the three or four i picked up there really was i think once it's mainly what it is now it looks like it's uh picture captures from from porn movies yep yep oh yeah i mean i, I remember distinctly that they i, I heard they're back in probably like i guess 70s or so there was actually this sort of like underground you know uh science fiction group who would like challenge each other to get stories in like penthouse letters or something like that yeah. you know and it's just like i think that was really kind of fun it's like you know and there's, there's been this long tradition of kind of like doing you know smutty stuff for money um but yeah unfortunately it's no longer really valid i mean uh, i know there's some places that are still putting up you know short stories but you know my big bread and butter 
like yours was, was anthologies. Um, but those are pretty much kind of like, you know, dried up. A bit. You know, a lot of the publishers were doing it. Um, don't do it anymore. So it's kind of like, well, you know, that's so much for that idea. Well, you should talk about the new anthology that we had that just came out. The one with, with our stories in it, the science fiction one. Yes. Yes. Really quickly. Um, shout out. And I'm, I'm pretty happy about this. I haven't started the publicity as much as I should because I'm recovering from some surgery, but, um, it's called nine to eternity and it's out now from futures past editions. And it's a, it's an anthology of science fiction, no erotica, um, just right up, right, straight up science fiction stories. And it has stories from yourself, uh, Jean Marie Stein, author Byron cover, Ernest Hogan, Emily Devonport, Cynthia Ward, David Lee Summers, and such. And so, yeah, definitely pick it up. It's currently available on Amazon, Nine to Eternity. Um, there is a there. Is, it follows up um, a previous book, um, which I'm embarrassed to say I can't really remember the title. <laughs> um, it still came know, out but, before. <laughs> yeah, it came up. Well, the idea was it's funny because you know just to go on a little bit about this, it's like you know the publisher. You know, when I, back when I was working for the publisher, we were really fortunate to work with some really cool authors because the goal of this publishing company was to kind of like authors who didn't probably get as much respect as they did. And we wanted to sort of like, kind of like get their word out about their work. And one day I was sitting down with a publisher and we sort of said, you know, we got all these authors. We should do an anthology because, you know, they're all, you know, you know, part of this little collective. And we did that, and then it, it it was you know pretty successful. So we decided to do a follow up. Except this time, we also asked the original uh, the original writers to ask their friends or people they think you know should also get more attention to join in. So the book, you know, you know, jumped up quite a bit. Yeah, and I was happy about that because I got in. But nope. um, yeah, now now Chris, the, let's talk about the operation. What happened was kids. Um, this has been a long time coming because uh, Chris had to get something reduced. It was yeah. just, it's just yeah. too big. Yeah. And, yeah. and women yeah. were just scared basically. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. You know, if you, if you be, when you meet Chris, you don't know this apparently, you know, it's not apparent, but you see him in a bathing suit. I mean, you know, and so <laughs> he had to go in for this reduction because it was just, I mean, you know, it basically, it was putting, um, you know, uh, women and men to shame. Exactly. And, uh, you just couldn't. You know, nobody really could would could measure up, so to speak. So mm -hmm. this is what he did recently, and we're all we're all the better for it. You know. Yep. 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 I can finally I can finally be a, a productive member of society now. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, it just this wasn't a really big deal, but it, it definitely made my life quite a bit easier. Yeah, I mean, because you know, just, uh, you, just uh, yeah, I mean, because he was stopped in airports. You know, it just wasn't pretty. <laughs> wasn't, and you know. And I, you know, I was with him a lot, and I'm like, yeah, I know this is the way it is. What are you going to do? But you know, <laughs> you know, a man in his salami. But uh, you know, I, I um, really love the fact it's like people say, "Oh, I'm sorry, what kind of surgery?" And I have to say, plastic surgery, and it makes me sound right. like I got Botox or something. Yeah, got his breast done done again. Um, yep, exactly. <laughs> well, just the, for the last 15 minutes, let's tell you, tell everybody look, they're listening to Licking Non Vanilla. With M. Christian and Ralph Greco Jr. I'm not sure which I am, but I just. <laughs> um, Chris, you know, before we, I had like a little list going in my head, which is a scary place to be. <laughs> and we were talking about movies before Maryland, so I wish maybe we we can leave with this. But like, yeah. do you have a top, even a top three movies that you think are? Because you and I go through this all the time about science fiction movies. We could do this forever. Oh but yes. Do you have any like say a top? three that you think of are the sexiest movies that you could even oh. think of off the top of your head? You know, it's it's weird. Um, a mainstream. I mean, we're not talking about adult films, but mainstream films. No, mainstream. Yeah, stuff that yeah. other people may have seen. Not not yeah. some erotica that you and I would only have seen. Yeah. I think my favorites would have to be um, Salome's Last Dance by Ken Russell. Okay. Um, I just particularly love that one because Ken Russell is always very sexy anyway. No matter oh, yeah. who he yeah. is. He always like you know gets in there and act, act, acts like a wild maniac, right? Um, and I particularly like that one because it's just so weirdly stylized. And I have a fondness for like decadence, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one of my favorites. Um, it's, it's a tough call for the third. Um, I mean for the second. Um, 
But I do know particularly one that no one ever thinks about, but I particularly thought was really quite a hot scene is in Name of the Rose. Um, you know, there's a sex scene in that that I thought was really spectacularly done because it was very feral. It didn't feel staged. It, it, mm-hmm. it was really quite interesting. And that's, I can't remember the director's name, but it's based on this murder mystery set in a, in a monastery. And for some reason, I think Sean Connery is in it, but whatever. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that's one I particularly enjoyed. Um, but yeah, let's do yours because I'm sure I'll probably think of a third in a second. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I, cause there are, there are movies that the, there's a scene that just, you know, really struck me yep. and there, and, but the movie itself, like I, <laughs> Myra Breckenridge, which, you know, has been destroyed, you know, lamb, oh, yeah. you know, but there's a scene in Myra Beck- Breckenridge with, with Raquel Welch and the, and the, and the big cowboy guy. And she, mm-hmm. she makes him. And that yep. scene just is just absolutely outrageously naughty to me mm-hmm. and uh, I, that comes to mind you know the typical ones like nine and a half weeks not really nah. uh, I, i'm trying to think of you know there's there's been other i mean there's there's been others that i mean i think secretary was kind of odd in its own way mm-hmm. um with with jill and hall and uh spader i like mm-hmm. some of that because it was pretty it, it handled you know some a subject that was pretty interesting that i had never seen handled quite that way before mm-hmm. um but like off the top of my head it's tough i've been trying to rack my brain about this and i'm sure there's older movies you know that that um had a lot of had a lot of naughtiness to them when i was younger and i saw them and went oh what what's that about you know mm-hmm. um because i mean you know as a kid you'll see something you'll whoa, whoa what's that about you know oh, why, why, is that, why is that sexy I still remember the brothel scene in the Assassination Bureau Limited, which is actually one of my guilty pleasure movies. Okay. And when I stumbled across that when I was, you know, channel surfing, you know, when I was relatively young, it just blew me away. Um, you know, the same way that, like, you know, there, there's, you know, certain all those other kind of films for exactly the same kind of reason. Yeah, I think, I, you know, there's, there's, there's little things that, because I remember when we first got HBO, that was the big thing. You know, you catch, like, was that Angie Dickinson movie with Dirty Mama or Big? Oh Mama? yeah, oh yes, that's that's right? another fun one. That's a fun one. Yeah, that and that, and there's a lot of naughtiness in that one, you know, um, just to have her taken off her clothes, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, th- I think Shatner is in that, if I'm not mistaken. I think it is. I, yeah, I think yeah. Is. So he's in there, and you know, there's oh, a couple yeah. of. I think it's called. Is it is it Bloody Mama or is it Dirty yeah. Mama? Uh, it's. I think it's Bloody Mama. There's. Yeah, I think so. And then there's. Um, the, uh, there was a whole bunch of other ones that, but but like you and I, I don't think I don't think we go for the. T- I mean, the, the unbearable lightness of being was pretty sexy. Oh yes, oh yes. Right? And what with a wife to cook, it's her lover and somebody. Oh, in the- uh, Peter Greenaway. Oh my god, yeah. Peter Greenaway is always fantastic. I love Peter Greenaway. How about that other movie? Did you ever see that movie Exotica? Oh was yeah, that- that's a great one with the strip club. Yep. And the guy like the walls of the strip club. That was a pretty cool movie. Yeah, yep. There's also one uh, Jeffrey Rush and Quill. Oh so yeah, the, uh, Mark Sod, um, and I usually I find like you know usually the ones that are exploitative films like you know uh, Salva, which is just kind of gratuitous and it's not really designed to be erotic, it's just designed to be weird. But you know a lot of the French films like I always like Diva, you know, which is a French you know, noir thriller and yeah, really mm-hmm. sensual mo- movements moments, even though it is actually explicitly erotic. Right. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other ones like that. The French New Wave always had a nice, you know, kind of sexy quality to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think the thing is like now that, that you have the ability to search these things out, because you know if you if you go on Netflix or Hulu, I mean, there there's a lot of content being produced, and some of it can be quite naughty and good, you know. And there's a lot, and there's also a lot of garbage like anywhere else, you know. Um, but what we're talking about is searching out the older stuff. Yep. And I would I would champion you to do that because there's a lot of good stuff out there that you may have never seen. You know, um, Chris, Chris and I talk about horror mo- horror movies and science fiction movies all, all the time like this. But there's a lot of good erotica that did come out over the years that is worth checking out. If you can, you know, just do it. Oh, thing. yeah. I mean, it's, it's remarkable how they handle things. I mean, like, for instance, if you look at like Russ Meyer movies. You know, Russ Meyer movies are, you know, they're, they're very rarely is anything close to explicit sex, but they have this right. weird kind of grindhouse sexuality to them that is really very intriguing. 
Oh, yeah. um, you know, those kind of things. A lot of Corman movies had the same kind of thing. And then you even had like certain, like, I remember distinctly, there's a lot of hammer horror films from the 70s, uh, you know, like vampires. Uh, is it vampire circus? And there's a whole bunch of like themed horror movies from the 70s. And I'm afraid I can never keep them apart, but there's one with a, a snake dance that um, I remember watching it on, uh, I think it's on Amazon prime going like, crap, this was done in the seventies in the theaters because it's like, you know, there's basically a naked woman writhing on the floor. It's like kind of blew me away. Yeah. We had, there, there's a, I remember what, I don't know about where you live. I'm sure it was the same way. We had the four thirty movie. Did you have the four thirty movie? Oh yeah. We had all those kind of things. Creature okay. features and all that. Kind right. of stuff. It was always a highlight of my Saturdays. Oh my God. But the four thirty movie would inevitably like one week out of the year would run horror movies. Right. And so you'd get five horror movies in a week and it would be usually the, the you know, the the, the Poe Hammer ones or the or the Roger Corman ones. And those movies inevitably had the most big breasted women you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> and I mean, you know, so I'm like I'm a prepubescent kid. I'm maybe 12, 13. Mm-hmm. And I, just, I I'm just like losing my mind watching these movies, you know. <laughs> Because all the, you know, so they're all Victorian period pieces. So of course, there's mm-hmm. a lot of déclaré, as they say, and uh, yep. and my God, the women were just you couldn't, you couldn't. And like Chris said, like they would throw in like a a sexy uh, dance with snakes mm-hmm. or some woman writhing on the floor, and you're like, I know I shouldn't be watching this, but this is, <laughs> you know, and, uh, so that like that, so it's a lot of fun stuff out there. Which you know, years ago, I was at a convention where. Ellison was at and and Asimov were at sort of science fiction convention in the city. And uh, there's a whole bunch of guys around it. Uh, there was a couple of guys doing a, a talk, you know, and they were interviewing one guy about, I think it was a costume designer. And somebody said, well, you know, why, why do all your women, like all the women costumes showing a lot of skin, you know? Mm-hmm. And he was like, Oh, look, I'm a hetero guy. I like to look at women with no clothes on. What can I tell you? It's like, so it's obvious who are making these movies, you know? <laughs> like, come on, man. You know, so the fun stuff. But, like, the stuff of your youth, definitely, it'll stick with you forever, too. That's what I'm thinking. Exactly. And, you know, one thing is funny we mentioned that because another little weird science fiction erotica crossover is uh, uh, William Rossler, Bill Rossler. Uh-huh. And Rossler himself is quite a fascinating character. Um, in fact, he's been republished by uh, Futures Past Editions as well. And Rossler, he was uh, an artist. He actually he actually provided the materials for the Nebula Awards. Um, he was a Hugo Award winning cartoonist because he was very known for his cartoons. He was a novelist because he wrote some really quite good books, uh, Patron of the Arts and To the Land of the Electric Angel and so forth. But he was also an adult filmmaker. Okay. Um, though he didn't do anything really necessarily explicit, but I remember distinctly picking up like, there was something weird, which is still around, but I think they're kind of like, you know, no longer doing a lot, which would release these older stag house films and such. And then he did one called Street of a Thousand Pleasures or something like this. Um, but I just kind of love that weird kind of crossover. In fact, he even wrote a book on the history of the erotic cinema. So it's again, it's just like that kind of like, you know, crossover there. But I also like the fact that, again, his stuff isn't really explicit. It's just kind of TNA kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And that's the, like again, that stuff sticks with you forever. Mm-hmm. You know, you oh, he's a photographer too. So. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. It, it's just amazing how like the stuff from way way back, you know, it just crosses your your mind's eye like one late Saturday night, you know, mm-hmm. or you know, you happen to catch it on, you know, I mean, uh, whatever it happens to be, and, and you're like, I can never get that out of my mind, you know, that's yep. like, the thing. What, and it could have been, it could have been a cartoon, too, I mean, there's a lot of that stuff that happens, we were talking about Hentia before, you know, Japanese, oh, yeah. it's just amazing what the stuff sticks with you, you know. And I love particularly, I know we're winding down here, I love, particularly, I think it's also kind of a generational thing, because often it was also context, so, you know, now you can get access to any kind of explicit material you want, and Frankly, you know, the, the parental controls are very easily bypassed. Um, yeah. But back when, you know, we were younglings and, you know, um, you know, praying hooky from school and skipping stones by the creek and, you know, uh, making corncob pipes, um, it was so rare to find this kind of stuff. I remember like National Lampoon was my big introduction. So it was Underground Comics. Yeah. Um, so finding like, oh, my God, I just saw a bare breast was like 
staggering. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and you're right about comics, too. Or or even a magazine. You're like, mm-hmm. oh, my God, look at that. <laughs> I, I can see line of a, I don't even know what I'm looking at, but oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> funny. Very funny. Well, as always, we traipse uh, well across the, uh, the landscape of sexual culture. Um, we also should do a little bit of a shout out to our listeners in Ireland, especially. We, we uh, according to the show's producer, we are seeing an incredible uptick in the popularity of the show in Ireland. Um, India also, but Ireland now surpasses the USA in downloads of, of looking on vanilla. And we are stoked and thrilled. We are confused as well because we don't know why this is. And maybe we shouldn't even care to ask because it's a wonderful thing. So hello to everyone listening to us in Ireland, downloading to us. And do us a favor, if you're of a mind, get in touch. You can get in touch through the Licking Non Vanilla website. Um, you could uh, – and that's where you go to, to, to email us. And let us know what's going on out there because we're in the U.S. So we don't, we don't particularly know. And since everything's really closed up at this point – we want to know what's what's happening out there. What maybe what subject you want us to handle? Absolutely. But um, we thank you though. We're happy you're aboard, and uh, you know, raise a Guinness to us. Whatever, or we'll raise one back to you. Um, <laughs> but we're but we're thrilled. And uh, so I, I I guess we're going to sign off now, Chris. But as always, it's been a thrill talking. Always to you. wonderful. Always wonderful. Yeah, we have a good time, and we're, we're going to do a new, another one real soon too. So we'll get that up. Yep. And uh, this has been Licking Non Vanilla with Ralph Recco Jr. and Chris, otherwise known as M. Christian. And we'll see you next time, kids. Bye bye. And visit us on the web at www.lickingnonvanilla.com. <laughs>